have a quick prayer. Father God, as we come before you this morning, we pray for your word. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else in Jesus' name. Amen. Bit of a tongue twister, that uh, one this morning. When I was asked about the theme this morning, my first reaction to that particular uh, reading on which I'm bringing the message this morning was, Oh, I've done it again. And I don't think there's a person in this room, there's not a person in this room who hasn't said the same thing over the years in their Christian lives. It's certainly a very interesting passage, and it's a passage that's been interpreted in many different ways over the years. There's been much theological discussion on it. What was Paul thinking? What was he doing at the time? And probably in some ways it is a very challenging passage. But it's also a very encouraging passage for Christians to meditate over, for Christians to take into uh, their heart and just to think about what Paul is actually getting at here. And I think it's one of those passages we can all relate to as per our information sheet that, oh, I've done it again. One of the major hurdles that many Christians encounter in their lives is after having accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they expect their lives to be all hunky-dory, nice, easy, flowing, going from one lovely rose-covered colored pasture to another. But it's not like that, is it? Not like that at all. Suddenly, it's as if your previous life was the bed of roses and this new born-again life is fraught with troubles and tribulations and trials. I can't tell you how many times I've beaten myself up over things that I've done problems that I've encountered when I've wandered off the track. And I can't tell you how many people over the years have come up to me with the same problems. And they've confided me in, in me, asking why they seem to be suffering so many problems in this new life. They thought that Christian life was going to be easy, just a bed of roses. But now they're experiencing disturbing problems, disturbing thoughts, disturbing disturbed, disturbed life. The truth is that problems do arise. And unless you can identify what the problem is, you can't solve it. I mean, in this last week, we've seen problems in the world where they send teams of people to figure out what the problem's been. There's been this submarine that imploded looking for the Titanic. And they sent a team out there to find what had gone wrong so that it won't happen again. So similarly, in many ways, in the lives in which we live, we identify what the problem is. And once we've identified those problems, we can resolve them and hope that they don't happen again. Let's face it, if we look at our Christian lives and we draw it out on a graph, what's it going to look like? Anyone care to volunteer what it's going to look like? Yes. Absolutely. Ups and downs. It's not going to be a sort of calm ocean with a gentle swell. Instead of the smooth ride that we've expected, it's going to be ups and downs. It's going to be helter-skelters and big, what do they call them, the uh, roller coaster ride of life. The Big Dippers, the, the Tower of Death, the Magic Mountain of Terror, as you scream upwards into the clouds and then come crashing down again. And this is life. It has its ups and it has its downs. And these are inescapable. But Jesus never said that life was going to be easy. It would be nice to have a nice smooth ride, but that's not what it's going to be. And this is what our scripture today really highlights in many ways. It's the issues of the troubles that we have. And it focuses on the cause and how we can fix it. First of all, to bring the text into context, we see in verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. That's verse 14. 
The law that Paul is referring to here is God's law, God's commandments, in light of which we're all condemned. Verse 13, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produces death in me through what was good. So that through the commandment, sin might be utterly sinful. In other words, God's law is identifying in our lives those areas which are sinful. In other words, the law itself identifies the sin. No law, no sin. Ironical, isn't it? If there wasn't a law, there wouldn't be a crime. And we've seen that in the world today. We've seen problems with crime in some towns where they've decided to decriminalize something and then the following year say, look, we've solved the problem of theft because theft is no longer a crime. Ipso facto, no law, no crime. But God's law highlights those areas that need identification. In other words, when we become those born-again Christians, we recognize God's law. We recognize what is good, we recognize what is right, and we recognize what's not. Before that, these things didn't seem to bother us. But now, in new light, the light of God's law, the spirit that dwells in us highlights those areas in our lives that needs attention. The law of God reveals our sinful nature. We used to be ignorant of the sinful nature in which we lived. But his benchmark highlights our shortcomings. Thus, we start seeing things in a different light. Strangely enough, the other thing that the law produces is our rebellious nature. And we're all guilty of this, aren't we? When the Lord draws a line in the sand, when he puts that sign up, do not cross this line, keep off the grass, what's the first thing we do? We've all done it. You walk through a park and there's a sign that says, keep off the grass. We see a sign, wet paint, do not touch. What do we do? We do, don't we? It's our nature. Don't walk on the grass. Don't touch the red paint. Some time ago, there was a television program you may remember called Candid Camera. And it's off, offshoots. And they set up a town square somewhere in Europe, somewhere or other. And right smack bang in the middle of the town square was a column with a big red button on it. You can guess what it's going to say. It says, do not press. 50,000 cameras around. And you'd be, well, actually, you wouldn't be surprised the number of people who would walk past. It's in our nature to be rebellious. We can't help ourselves. As Paul says, the law is spiritual. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. And ironically, it's that little voice that whispers in our ears, go on, go on, do it. It's the very same voice that later says, you're a naughty boy or girl. You allowed to say that? I suppose so. It's a bit like the laws. God's law is very much like a jewelry shop. I was thinking about how God's law illustrates the sinfulness of us. We think it's just a blot, but it's not. It's more than that. And the illustration that came to mind is a jewelry shop. Have you noticed how jewelry is displayed? If you have a string of diamonds, they don't put those diamonds against a sparkling white satin cloth. No. They put it against the darkest possible black velvet to show the sparkle of the diamonds. And God's law is very much like that in reverse. 
it has a background of diamonds, the purity, the silverness, the cleanliness, the purity, highlighting the darkness that lies within each one of us. We try to do the right thing. We have the best intentions of the world to go out there to please a living and loving God. We try so much, but, as Paul says, I do not understand what I do, for what I do, I do not want to do, but I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer me myself who do it, it is the sin living in me. I know nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what I do do good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do is not what I want to do, but what I keep doing. We can all associate with that, can't we? We try and do the best we can. How many of us can relate to Paul's experience here? Show of hands? Absolutely. You know exactly what I mean, don't you? You want to do something, but you don't do it. You don't want to do something, and you do it. Oh, I've done it again. It's like there are two of us. We have an argument within our head. How often have we had that argument? That struggle within us, the general struggle of the Christian life. It's the same that Paul is referring to here. You know what you want to do. You know what you shouldn't do. You want to do right, but you don't do it. The problem is not the lack of knowledge. You know what the knowledge is to do it. The problem is not the lack of desire. You know you, you desire to do it. The problem is not the lack of direction. You know which way you should be going. The problem is a lack of power. That's the problem. He, that's Paul, like us, knew what to do. And like us, he wanted to do the right thing. The problem was the power to do it, or the power not to do it. The power how to do it. And this seems, on the face of it, to show that there may be a weakness in the law. The law lays down the rules. It tells us what to do and what not to do but it doesn't say how. And this is the point of Paul's discussion, Paul's writing here, Paul's argument. The law in itself exposes our base nature. The law highlights our mortality, highlights our imperfections. The law shows us that when we sin, we act against the nature of this new creation that we have become through Christ Jesus. And this is what causes the problem. This is what causes the angst. This is what causes the conflict within. The disturbance is in our spirit. We're convicted in our hearts and minds of the wrong that we continually seem to do. When a Christian sins, when we do those things that we shouldn't do, and don't do those things that we should do, we act against the very nature of this new creation that we are in Christ Jesus. We are new creations in Jesus the Christ. We are this new person, and we act against that nature. That's not the case for a person who hasn't been born again. When a Christian sins, they're acting in accordance with their nature. When a, sorry, when a non-Christian sins, they're acting in accordance with their own nature. But when a Christian sins, they're acting against that new nature. The new nature is why there is a struggle. And that's why the battle rages. That's why there is this internal conflict. And it's this turmoil that Paul is illustrating. It's this turmoil that Paul is addressing. 
verse 21. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. There are two opposing forces, two ideas in our mind. We have the sinful nature and we have the new creation. Illustration put forward many years ago by the great Billy Graham when he was explaining the twin natures that dwell within all of us. And he used the illustration of the wolves, the good wolf and the bad wolf. I don't know if any of you have heard that. Very basically, it's the story of a grandfather explaining to his grandson that within each one of us, there's a battle going on between two wolves. One is sinful, he's angry, he's envious, he's jealous, he's full of sorrow and regret and greed and arrogance and self-pity and guilt and resentment and inferiority and lies and pride and superiority and ego. He said, but the other wolf is a good wolf. He's full of joy, he's full of peace, he's full of hope, he's full of serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion and faith. And this battle between the wolf continues all one's life. And the little boy says, well, who wins? And the old man says, whichever one you feed. Paul says the law exposes the evil, which is right here within me. You know, it's only the person who desires to do the right thing, who tries to do good, who fails who was aware of this struggle. You may remember that time when Jesus touched your life. Before that, you pretty much did what you wanted to do. You said what you wanted to say. You didn't bother about the way things went. Life just seemed so plain sailing, no regrets. Some people hanker after those days but don't ever wish them back. There are many people in the world today who think it's bad to have the devil as an enemy, but trust me, it's far worse having the devil as a friend. It's a worse place to be in than in the struggle one might be going through now. Like the words of the song, if you dance with the devil, then you haven't got a clue because you cannot change the devil, no. The devil changes you. We're blessed, strangely enough. It's one of the ironies of the world of life. We're blessed to have trouble in our lives. It's the troubles that we have that are a sign of life. The Spirit himself highlights those areas that bring trouble to our hearts, knowing that we need to change. Jesus himself didn't promise us smooth sailing. He said, in this world you will have trouble. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. So as I said at the beginning, be encouraged. We all feel got at and down sometimes. Even Paul, we see here in verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? We feel despair sometimes going through the trials and tribulations of life. But be encouraged, you're not alone. We may be wretched, we may be worn out, we may be calloused, we may be beaten down. How often have we been beaten down, I wonder? The problem is identified as Paul continues onward. Going back to the verses we have had from Paul, he's describing the person who wants to please God, who wants so desperately to lead a righteous life. He wants to overcome sin and trying their hardest to overcome it. But your willpower, your willpower, is not enough. 
If your willpower was enough, then you'd stop sinning, wouldn't you? Makes logical sense. Anyone think that their willpower is sufficient? Stop sinning. The truth is that our characters are not strong enough to overcome the temptations of this life. If you think it is, then you would. Just stop sinning. Simply put, human beings simply are not strong enough. And Paul here admits that he's worn out. He's wretched. He's had enough. Because he's been trying to please God through his own strength, through his own willpower, not unlike many Christians in the world today. We feel hard done by, and we try so hard to do the right thing. But Paul here admits that he needs help. He's calling out to God, help me. Who can rescue me from this body of death? At last, Paul starts to look outside of himself for help. Up to this point, it's been interesting to note that Paul's whole focus has been on himself. What he's done, or what he wants to do, or what he hasn't done, or what he doesn't want to do. Much like ourselves. Our focus is on our own abilities. Problem identified. And here in the scripture passage today, in 10 verses, verses 14 to 24, in 10 verses, Paul refers to himself 28 times. Yes, I have counted them. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I do, I do not want to do. What I do, I hate to do. And what I hate to do, I do. And I do what I do not... I, sorry. And I do what I do not want to do. I agree that the law is good, and so on. Throughout, Paul is saying, Paul can do it better. Paul has to do better. Paul better do better. And he finishes up with verse 24, Oh, what a wretched man I am. And he calls out for help. Who will rescue me? So now we have the solution. Paul starts to look outside of himself. He starts to realize that he is incapable, like us, of resolving our own particular spiritual predicament. Verse 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. At last, the solution. What a turning point that is in his argument. Now we see the problem, and now we see the choice. After all the despair, after all the problems, after all the self-recriminations, the eyes, the me's, suddenly, Lord, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That turning point where the problem is seen and we now see the choice, the solution. So the final question is, where are we? Where are you in terms of chapter 7? Are we still in the I, 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 the me, me, me of verses 14 to 24? Or have we made it through to 25 and thank God for Christ Jesus our Lord? Where he's our savior, where he's our focus, where he is our victory. The inward focus of many Christians these days the teachings that we hear, that we watch, that we see on television. The teachings of you can do it, the power is within you. You name it, you claim it. The subtle lies of the deceiver are all around us these days. And it takes our earnest desire to do God's will, to please him, and to, to, to turn outwards rather than with the inwards that were directed by so many the power is not within us. The power is in Jesus. 
We don't need motivational speakers. We need a savior. We don't need to be told that you're good enough. We need Christ Jesus to take that from us. Here we see Paul thanking God for Jesus. He sees Jesus bridging the gap between himself and the Lord God, providing the way to eternal glory. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Paul sees the victory in Jesus. He sees the struggle. He understands the struggle as we all do. And he still sees the problems. He sees the trials. He sees the tribulations. But he sees and praises God for the final victory brought about through Christ Jesus and in Christ alone. And it is in Christ alone that we have that wonderful victory. Despite the fact that from time to time we will say, Oh, I've done it again. We still have that victory in Jesus. Let's pray.